Today we start actually the first uh, official seminar of NYC Teachers Club with uh, Mr. Beach. Peter has been working in the EFL in Greece since 1986 and has been training teachers since completing his Master of Science in Teaching English in 1997. He has provided training seminars for schools throughout Greece since 2004 and has been running TEFL certificates courses full-time. He also works part-time for the UK Open University, tutoring on the MA in Education, Applied Linguistics at the New York College in Athens, tutoring on the University of Greenwich, BA in TESOL and MA in the English Language Teaching Management. Thank you. Well, good morning everyone. Thank you for coming. I hope you all got here more easily than I did. And obviously we've got a fairly small number of people here today, so what I want to try to do is to get you involved as much as possible. I think um, this was built as an interactive seminar. The fewer people there are, the more you interact. So, what we're trying to do is give you some general ideas about um, methodology and how the communicative approach can enable us to become better teachers. And while we're doing that, what we also want to do is make some links to our program, the BA program, and also our Masters in ELT Management. Um, so what we'll do is talk for maybe about 40-45 minutes more generally about questions of methodology and communicative approach and then we'll take a few minutes just to introduce you to our programmes and then also at the end of everything open it up for questions. But I'll have lots of questions for you along the way. So, one of the overall aims of the methodology strand in our programme is to give you a practical understanding of the ways in which the theory underlying the communicative approach can help us to become better teachers. And what we tend to find is that a lot of people who might be familiar with the theory possibly have studied the theory and they know what the communicative approach is all about on a theoretical level are actually not implementing it in practice in the classroom. And this goes back to a study that Kia Karavat did several years ago, um, about 15 years ago, where she reviewed the beliefs of teachers in Greece and also observed the practice of how teachers really do teach or at that time did teach in Greece. And what she found was that most people think that they are <coughs> implementing the communicative approach, but in practice it turns out they're really not as much as they would like to be. And of course we've had a lot of input in Greece over the past several years in terms of communicative approach. Um, we've had a lot of research that's been done by Pedagogy Guys to do it that's coming through into the classroom eventually through the school's advisors. Um, we've got the curriculum which is providing for a communicative approach to teaching in state schools. And of course now we've got the last year or so uh, a return to having books provided for the University of <coughs> by the Ministry of Education rather than choosing books as teachers were doing for the past several years. So in many ways we've got a very strong emphasis in theory, in curriculum, in materials, on the communicative approach. What we tend not to have, as Keir pointed out back at this time, is actually communicative teaching in the classroom. So what we want to try to do, both in this little session today and more generally in our programme, is to give you the tools to be able to use the communicative approach in practice. So first of all, how many of you teach? Okay, so those of you at the back who are not yet teaching, okay, and those at the front all are, okay, <laughs> that probably says something about where you choose to sit as well. Okay, so those of you who do teach, how many of you have been observed? 
Good. So I think everyone who teaches has also been observant, don't you? What did you gain from that? From the observation. Yes. What did you gain from being observant? Feedback. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you get feedback from the observer. What kind of people have been observing you? Supervisors, I suppose, okay. school owners. Uh -huh. Yeah. So very often the supervision is, um, let's say, part of the management hierarchy, and you might be observed in the private sector by school owners or possibly by a, a school advisor in the public sector. And in a way, that can be quite a, a challenge, it can be quite unnerving because the observation isn't there to enable you, it's there to judge you and grade you and maybe sack you if you're not very good. Um, or the kind of observation that we tend to do, Amy and I and Corinne, is much more enabling, much more formative. We are grading our training teachers on their teaching, but we're giving them feedback in order for them to improve. So it's not intended to be judgmental. And insofar as it is evaluative, it's enabling, it's giving you ideas about how you teach in order to help you to improve. So when people do a training course, like a, a four-week TEFL certificate course, or what we do in the third year of our BA programme, observing your lessons in order to give you feedback, in order to enable you to reflect and consider ways in which your teaching can improve. Now have any of you had that kind of observation? Okay, so all the observation you've had has been by supervisors, by school owners, by people who were really just checking up on you. Okay, well the other thing in which um, you might find is a very useful way to underpin your development is to observe each other as well. Mm -hmm. Just choose a friend, a colleague, someone you trust and pair up together to observe each other so you can get feedback on the kind of things that you want to get feedback on from someone whose opinion you respect. Okay, so um, what we want to try to do then is ensure that our teaching is at least doing what we set out to do. And if we want to teach in a communicative way, then we want to be aware of how far we're doing that. What Kigara points out is that there are several surface behaviours which are clearly in conflict with the communicative approach. Um, so, for example, the teacher-fronted classroom like this with one person at the front giving you um, knowledge. What would be the equivalent or the alternative in a communicative classroom? Rather than being teacher fronted, how else could it be? With a round table maybe? Yep, uh -huh. So often the classroom setup, the way we arrange the furniture, can influence the kind of methodology we tend to employ. And if you're in a classroom with round tables or a horseshoe shape or something like that, it's likely the activity is going to be much more learner centred. The two tend to go together and use different seating arrangements for different types of activities to provide variety as well. So it could be that rather than being so teacher fronted, then the class could be more learner centred, and of course that then has implications for what the role of the teacher is in a community classroom, not transmitting knowledge as we often tend to do. So then maybe you wouldn't have such an explicit focus on the form. So if you don't focus on the form, if you're not analysing, okay, you've got have or has plus past participle and stuff like that, what else would you be doing in the classroom? Rather than just analysing the, the form of the language, let's say in a grammar lesson, you're analysing the structure of a particular tense, what would the alternative be? For the same outcome, for the same reason? Yes, with the same objective. Act it out. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
or let's say just provide communicative activities, communicative tasks. So if you want to focus on the use of the present perfect symbol in that example, um, you can discuss experiences, places you have visited, things you have done, um, provide tasks where the learners are naturally going to be using the target language rather than focusing explicitly on the language. Something we'll come on to towards the end of this little session when we look a little bit at the implications of second language acquisition research for the way we teach. One thing that seems to come out quite strongly, one of the few things that SLA researchers all agree on, is that we don't actually want to focus on the form. And this seems a little paradoxical. You think if you want people to learn how to form this tense correctly, should you need to focus on that? But actually it seems not. It seems more beneficial and more enabling to the learners just to use the language to develop their communicative competence and in doing that, in using the language, they will automatically acquire the correct form more easily, more quickly, more confidently than if they're actually analysing the form itself. So these are some of the observations that Kian made back in 1996. We've got a teacher-fronted classroom, we've got a very strong focus on form, and one other thing she said in the article that we didn't actually put on the slide there is that although the books, again, books provided for um, the junior schools by the Ministry of Education, at that time had no communicative activities, had a lot of pair work, a lot of group work, the teachers tended to avoid those, they tended just to skip over them. So, probably some of you were learning English in school Probably not 1996, maybe more like 2006 or in the early 2000s. How far do these observations about the style of teaching reflect your experience of learning English in school? Let's say when you were back in gymnasium, did you have a lot of communicative activities? Or did you have more focus on the form and the structure and traditional grammar exercises? Yeah. Uh -huh. Why do you think that is? Why? Why do you think that is? Why do you think teachers took that approach, even though they've got the ministry, they've got the pedagogico instituto, they've got the scholi pisimuli, all telling them don't do it like this, use the communicative activities that we are providing. Why do you think they don't? Right, it's easier not to be creative. I guess it's a generational thing that older teachers were used to doing it that way, they continue to do it that way. And often we become the teachers that we had. We adopt the kind of habits and style and methods of the teachers that we were taught by. But also there is a discrepancy between how we are supposed to teach and the teaching materials as well. Absolutely. Because the books are, are in that form. They require us to, dis to divide classes in vocabulary, listening, and now you do the grammar. So we focus on different forms each time. Yeah. So there's a lot of interplay between the methodological choices of the authors of the books and the methods that we use to implement those materials in the classroom and our own methodological beliefs. Um, again, something we'll come on to when we look at the, the theory of language and also the theory of learning that underpin our practice. So yeah, I think a lot of people find that it's just easier. Although in terms of the materials, um, the materials that have been provided by the, the Greek Ministry of Education for the last 20 years at least, have been designed to be communicative. And as Sir Kia mentioned in this article, that they have lots of pair work activities, lots of group work activities, and the teachers just skip them, just ignore them. <laughs> um, I want to add something. 
I've taught English as a second language and as a foreign language, and I've noticed uh, when teaching a foreign language, the grammar translation is used more often because they feel the need to have to give the translation right away without explaining it with a real situation. Yeah. So it depends on the context of learning as well. Maybe in an ESL context, an EFL context, there are changes. But I think there's a very clear link, anyway, as I was saying, between the methodologies that we choose to implement the materials we're given and the underlying theory. And perhaps the, the classic example of this is in audiolingualism, where you've got a very clear cut theory of language. And if you believe in the particular style of learning, the behaviourist theory that was the basis of the audio label method, then um, you're not going to see language like this as functional and communicative. You see language as being a system. It's a system of structures, of vocabulary, of um, phonological phenomena. And if you've got a, a theory of learning, like behaviorism, it says you provide a stimulus, you get the response, and you reinforce that response, then that's going to influence very strongly the ways you choose to teach. Now, in that particular example, an example is often used to contrast with communicative teaching, we actually know it's wrong. We know in the 60 or so years since behaviorism was in its heyday, we've learned a lot about how humans learn. We know this kind of model might describe how a rat or a dog in a laboratory can be trained to perform a task, doesn't capture the complexity of the way in which humans learn. And so if we reject that theory of learning, then we need to move on in terms of our teaching practice. And instead of regarding language as a system and learning as a series of stimulus, response and reinforcement, instead we have a more uh, sophisticated view of language and the need to use language to develop communicative competence, not just to, to learn a body of knowledge. And so, a theory of learning that would support the communicative approach um, depends upon using activities that involve real communication. And in this way, the learning almost takes care of itself. You use the language. Um, another approach that's become very popular in some contexts in recent years is content and language integrated learning. An extension of content-based learning where people might learn, let's say, something like physics at school probably in a country in Scandinavia for example and through studying physics they absorb the English because that's the medium through which their physics lessons are taught and so people are not studying English as such but they absorb the English through their lessons in something like physics um, an example, maybe an extreme example, is the kind of activity that is using communication. You're using the language, you're not learning about the language. Okay? Because what you want to do is not learn about the language in the way you might learn to memorise a little bit of translation from manual volume to take your exams and to pass that. What you want to do is to be able to use the language so you need procedural knowledge just as you need procedural knowledge to perform any other practical task, like playing tennis or riding a bicycle. So we need tasks that will give you opportunities to use the language in a meaningful way, and in using the language, you will absorb it and you will acquire it. So, my question for you, given these three principles, how would we adapt the design of our classroom activities? What kind of things would you want to avoid doing and what kind of things would you want to do in the communicative language classroom?
I would give probably problem solving activities, something like doing a uh, solving a problem like for example um, going somewhere in the city if I had to teach the propositions of place and then give them a map and ask them to find their way to Colorado Square let's say um, right. but again this based on this theory of learning for which I'm not very well acquainted with, but anyway, I suppose that what it means is that you have to do uh, particular things which are related to a certain uh, goal, okay? And the goal is to communicate in a real situation. Yeah, exactly. So you want to use the language realistically. That's a very interesting example. Let's say communication gap activities where you're giving directions, the other person's asking for directions. But again, this has to be realistic in the sense, imagine, I mean, I would ask, because we have seen this, it's not my original idea, we have seen this in books, but they ask students, and you're more well aware with the books, they ask students, for example, to find their way in the Big Bang, and we know that students, most of our students, have never been to London, so it's not realistic at all, I mean, what would they be interested in finding their way in? Big Bang, for example. But if you ask them to find their way uh, in the square nearest to their house, it might have more realism in it. Right, so we want to adapt to the local circumstances and culture. You were going to say something? Yeah. I want to add something to this girl said. I think that uh, when we have a <coughs> our students to the real uh, situation, for instance, if you want to uh, bring them in the Colonel Square, for instance. What is real? I struggle that it will be much more memorable to them, not something with our own situation comes. Right, it's real, it's linked to their own personal experience. Um, but I think extending it's okay, so you can have your communication gap activity, each person has their role, asking directions, giving directions, and you're learning your prepositions of place. You go up the hill and you turn left, and stuff like that. Um, what tends to happen though is that people are not um, using communicative competence. You've got the linguistic competence there. They've learned, hopefully, um, the structures, they've learned the prepositions, they've learned the target vocabulary, but they're not communicating effectively. Um, because all of the communication strategies that go with that tend to be left out. So if you want to ask someone, you don't say, hello, where is the British Council? <laughs> Not if you're English anyway. You say, excuse me, sorry to bother you, but I was wondering, could you possibly tell me? <laughs> or something like that. But anyway, you, you've got some sort of interactional language going on there. You've got some sort of politeness, strategies. Um, in order to communicate competently, you need to rehearse that. You need to be aware of that and not just isolate the target mm -hmm. language. So, um, this is part of the answers to the question we just had taken from Richard and Rogers. Um, there are lots and lots and lots of things that we can do. Um, the example you gave also, of course, is an example of task based learning, which has been <coughs> very much. Um, popularised in recent years by Jane Willis and her husband Dave Willis, um, giving people communicative tasks to perform. So you don't have a syllabus greeted in terms of structures or any type of language items. You just have a series of tasks. You have to find the British Council, or you have to plan a trip. You've got a set budget, you've got a certain number of people, you've got a certain amount of time and you can use the language of suggestion and agreement and disagreement to reach a consensus. That kind of thing, using the language to perform tasks. Um, so the short answer is there are lots and lots and lots of things that you can do that Richards and Rogers were talking about ten years ago now. Do you think that the, those people who actually do teach, do the course books that you use conform to these kinds of criteria? 
about negotiation of meaning. Well, I think the short answer is probably they do. I think we've got a lot of options available mm. these days. We've got a lot of very good course books. We've also got a course starting next Friday about how to select and evaluate course books. So we should be on quite safe ground there. Um, the question then also becomes, if we're going to have these kinds of activities, um, how does the role of the learner differ as compared to the traditional classroom where maybe the teacher is telling you, the teacher is giving you a lecture, the teacher is passing on the knowledge and the learner is very passive. How is the, the role of the learner different in the communicative classroom? supposed to learn more efficiently, but that, that, that doesn't guarantee that at the end of the day he is going to be able to implement the communicative uh, tools or knowledge. Uh, I mean, it's one thing to teach communicatively, uh, and the new thing relatively, but it's an entirely different thing for the student to be able to become communicative like what I said before, excuse me, but it's hard to bother you, I'd like to know whether... You know, I mean, for that, he also needs to be in a realistic environment, like to be in London, or to be... Uh, to go out and meet to, with a tourist. He has to be exposed. And being in a classroom, even if it's a very, high, a very communicative lesson, it, it doesn't suffice. From my experience. <laughs> Yep, I think it's true. It's, in a way, you're trying to take an authentic situation, but you're transplanting it into an artificial one. But I think role plays like that can be a very important part of learning. And, you know, when people go away on a holiday to a country where they don't speak the language, they take their phrase book, and that's the kind of thing you find at the airport, at the restaurant, at the bus station. So you are given access to very practical things in a very accessible way. So I think this is the, the key to learning, to make the, the role of the learner much more active, so the learners are engaged in learning. And then the question naturally following from that is what is the role of the teacher? And we need to get away from this idea of the teacher being somebody who teaches, and think instead of other roles of the teacher as facilitator primarily so that the, the learners are at the centre of the action and the primary role of the teacher is to set up tasks for them and then monitor their performance of those tasks. The teacher in a community classroom most of the time should be on the sidelines. Now, I mentioned before that we've got a lot of knowledge which is hopefully trickling down into the classroom from second language acquisition research. And I've got here for you just three questions. First one here about pronunciation, and then also one about vocabulary and one about grammar. And my point essentially with these is, we have the answers. We don't have all the answers, we don't have the answers to everything. And there is an enormous amount of disagreement amongst researchers into second language acquisition about the underlying processes, the mental processes, what actually happens. But there's also substantial agreement. And there are some things which we can say we do know. And if we have the answers, then we know what we can do, what we can't do, what is not worth bothering to try to do and also, in a lot of cases, how to approach certain aspects of the business more efficiently. So, I think it's true adult learners find difficulty in acquiring native-like pronunciation. And usually people who begin to learn the language after the age of adolescence, let's say mid-teens, are usually unable to acquire native-like pronunciation. Why do you think that is? They think their pronunciation is okay, or the mind, the mind, the 
father, or they've tried and they have failed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it could be for various reasons. People just don't want to. They don't want to maybe integrate into the target language community, or they feel that having a bit of an accent is part of their own identity they want to preserve. But if we assume you have a learner who actually does want to achieve a perfect Cambridge accent, but still can't, why not? They are not taught, I think. Like that, because the phonetics phonology part of teaching language is almost absent in any teaching. Yes. Yeah. 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 So this is something, yeah. Uh, I think that uh, this happens because uh, all the students, all the learners, have all of their parts. For example, so it's very difficult as far as for the phonetics is concerned to go out as a Right, so their brain identifies certain sounds as associated with language and that kind of association after a certain age no longer occurs. So you can't have new sounds being acquired in the same way that the sounds of the first language were acquired after a certain age, which is part of the critical period hypothesis. There's a critical period after which you can't acquire language naturalistically. You can still learn it through study, as you can learn, let's say, other school subjects, but you don't acquire language in the same way with the ease that you acquire your first language. Then on the topic of vocabulary, one thing we often find is that people forget a lot of vocabulary. In a typical year, a typical student probably learns between about 700 and 1,000 words. You're probably going to be learning, um, let's say, about 5,000 words by the time you get to the level of B2 exams like the Cambridge First Certificate. But we forget most of them. If you teach, let's say, 15 words in one lesson, a month later, students will probably only remember three or four of those. So what can we do to help our learners to retain, to not forget the vocabulary they learn at them? Um, <coughs> Right, so things to make it more memorable from the answer, having a real fruit, so that people have a strong visual association with that, or having flashcards, things like that. In various ways, enhancing the input that we provide, so there are more stimuli, maybe combining different kinds of inputs, so you have visual and auditory as well, um, maybe even kinesthetic. Um, and then the other key to vocabulary retention is repetition. Because Greek people are very fond of quoting that the, the mother of all learning is repetition. I don't actually agree, but uh, I think in the case of vocabulary, if you teach, let's say, 15 words on Monday, you need to have a quick review of those at the end of the lesson on Monday. You need to have a quick review at the beginning of the lesson on Wednesday. You need to keep them fresh and then through constant recycling like that we can achieve a much higher rate of retention. I don't remember offhand statistics but I think it's something like um, after a year learners only remember about 15% of the vocabulary items they're taught if they don't have some sort of repetition and revision. So we need to build that into the way we do things. Stop it with this. How does this how does not this contradict with what we said before about the communicative approach? If it is just memory, why don't we just read the dictionary, for example, and repeat the words over and over, 
Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then eventually on Friday we might be able to to have, yes to acquire yeah. these fifteen words. Sorry. Yes, I, I, I a big question: Can they learn without associations? I mean, uh, can they learn words or no words? without associating these words with our interests, personal interests, or previous gain knowledge? Yep, it's so you have the affective dimension, let's say, um, what you're interested in. Uh, but also, of course, people do. And this is the origin of the Greek invention, which is the companion. Okay, those companions that you grew up with are a Greek invention. Nobody had ever thought of producing them before. The Greek publishers started doing it. And then the British public started saying, well, if they're going to make companions for our course books, we'll make our own companions. <laughs> and so it caught on. Um, so they do. You know, kids go home and they do it. The problem is they can't transfer that knowledge. And that's why often, particularly in the realm of grammar, you find people who know all the theory, and they can tell you, and they can recite the theory, and they can say things like, and stuff like that. But when they're actually trying to communicate, they don't, they can't. They're using present simple instead of present continuous and vice versa. Similarly with vocabulary. They may know the words on a certain level, they've learned the words, but they haven't acquired them. Um, and then with vocabulary, well, the, the folks I want to bring in here also is error correction, which is a a whole other issue as well. What would you think would be some good ways of correcting grammatical errors? That's a big question. It is a big question. In fact, I think as we're running a little bit late, I think maybe we'll skip this and we'll come back to it next time. No, I think I'll start by teaching students how to learn from their mistakes and not to have mistakes like such a strong impact on their motivation. Some people don't answer because they are afraid of making mistakes. So, before finding ways, I think, to correct mistakes, is teach our students that mistakes is a part of the learning process. I find it very important. And then they, you start negotiating. I think I always ask my students how they would like to receive feedback regarding their mistakes. Yeah. So certainly it's very important to be sensitive to the learners, but then on a more technical level, looking ahead towards the master's programme, uh, we should see errors as indications of the learners developing into language. So mm -hmm. this is wrong, it's bad, you punished. But it's just their progress towards the language. Okay, well let's start talking for about three quarters of an hour about some general questions, which is pretty much what we've done. Um, and that we'll have more discussion when we finish the whole thing. What I'd like to do next though is just talk a little bit about some of the modules in our bachelor's programme. Okay, so the BA programme in English language teaching at New York College is the programme of the University of Greenwich and it is a full-time three-year course so people who are already working might not be so um, interested in that. What I picked out is just a little bit here about the, the courses that I'm particularly interested in, mainly the ones that I teach, and Dora also teaches the second year course in methodology. So amidst all the other courses that we have each year, uh, with fun things like um, introduction to linguistics and stuff like that, we also have each year one methodology course of one course for each of the three years and each of these is three hours per week throughout the academic year from October to May. Um, so our thought, and this is a new thought, this is something we're going to be piloting, that we can invite people to attend these courses individually. Okay, you don't have to sign up for a full-time three-year BA programme, but you can come along for three hours a week, and maybe you might do it for three years if you want to. You can start with uh, the first year course, which is the introduction to English language teaching, a fairly broad and not very deep introduction, um, covering some of the basic issues about how we can um, 
do various things in the classroom, like error correction could be one of these on a fairly um, basic introductory level. So this is one of our courses, very practical and a lot of, I think, hands-on work in doing things like lesson planning, um, evaluating course books, looking at activities, looking at how we teach reading, for example, how we can make improvements to that. So that's the first year course. And then, second year, which last couple of years Laura has been teaching, picks up from that one and covers a lot of the same issues but in more depth. And one particular feature of the second year course is that it also includes some lesson observation. So you've got the opportunity to observe experienced teachers teaching and reflect upon that and write about that. And then in the third year, we've got the design and implementation of ELT materials. So this, um, this first term between now and Christmas, we'll be looking at some of the issues here with some of these fun books that we have here. Um, how to select, how to evaluate course books, how to adapt course books, how to write your own materials to supplement what's in the course books, and also, to a limited extent, how to write and publish your own course books. And then the second half of this course after Christmas is teaching practice. So you will have the opportunity to teach some ESL classes at the college. At the college. Um, you'll be observed, in this case by me, and then we have discussion with feedback on your teaching and suggestions about how you can improve, encouraging your own reflection about how you can improve your teaching. Okay, so that's a very brief look at the three courses in the methodology strand of the bachelor's programme. There are other courses as well that I won't go into. As I said, we'll deal with questions, our team of colleagues here will deal with questions in a few moments, but just briefly I'd like also to introduce you to our MA in the management of language learning. Now, as this is a postgraduate degree, first thing is there are some entry requirements. Now, what happened last year was that we had just this, this last summer graduated our first cohort from the bachelor's programme, so we didn't have people who had already finished our bachelor's programme to embark on the MA. This year we have, and then for those of you who will be in your third year of the bachelor's programme this year, um, is something you might want to consider. So obviously you'll have a good first degree, having completed our programme with us. Um, teaching experience, well you get some teaching experience in the third year of our programme and of course you will obviously have a very high level of English if you have come through our bachelor's programme. For people coming from outside you need a level of English equivalent to IELTS 6.5. And as an MA it's quite theoretical. Um, and in particular, a lot of the, the focus in several of the modules actually, there is the one which is purely SLA, which is another of Laura's um, babies, and then the methodology module which again picks up a lot of issues in second language acquisition research and looks at the implications of those for materials design and selection and practical implications in the classroom. Um, and we also have a module about ICT, Information Communications Technology and methodologies for using these relatively new technologies in the classroom. And then apart from the, the four modules there, we also have 
the, the fourth one I haven't mentioned, research methods, which gives you the underpinning to write your own dissertation. And then, having done this, there are lots of things that you can do. Um, either in terms of just simply being a better teacher for yourself, to develop your potential to, to teach in ways that are more informed, more theory based, but also moving beyond that, there are all kinds of other roles within the profession which a master's degree like this can equip you for more senior roles, um, maybe as a teacher trainer or a director of studies, or moving out of the teaching environment to other areas of linguistics like forensic linguistics, there are all kinds of interesting things that you can do with a degree like that. Um, okay, so as I say, we'll, we'll take questions. I say we because there are several of us, um, my colleagues including Alexander Cohen, the programme manager, who might be able to handle any of the more administrative type questions that you may have. So, questions. I want to go back to your presentation about the communicative approach. And if you could just give us a, um, the theoretical background which led to this approach that became so popular lately. Yeah, well the first thing I'll say is that it's not really lately. Um, communicative approach has its roots in the early 1970s. Um, but the background is essentially that um, there was a reaction against kind of theory of language and the kind of theory of learning that were embodied primarily in the audiolingual approach. So this was the approach that was very popular, let's say, immediately after the Second World War, going through the 1950s. And it's an approach which certainly does have certain benefits. You can see it in practice and I think we should always be cautious not to throw out the baby with the bathwater. Because, for example, when the US military wanted to train a lot of service people very quickly to be able to speak Japanese, they were able to do that. Okay, there are a lot of examples of attested success of this method. This but the Oligol was the, the one that the Postal Yes, exactly, the language lab. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, yeah. the, like the, the one which is in the they sell in this uh, yes. uh, interlingua inter or something. But they were oh, the lingua phone. Lingua phone, yeah. yes. The lingua phone was based on the... Yes, right. Okay. I'm very often, like, when I was at uh, university in the mid-1980s, we were doing this. You have the language laboratory. Which meant you were listening through the headphones, you were speaking into the microphone, the tutor would listen in at various points to different students and provide some sort of feedback. Um, and so as I were, mentioned. You were rotating the same material, so for example, you were saying the same sentence many times. Probably, uh, yes. Until you there are various ways of doing it. Um, one of the simplest is what's called a repetition <laughs> drill, so it's simply that you repeat or a substitution drill where you pick oh, a yeah. keyword and yeah. you have to yeah. substitute that in the phrase and adapt the phrase. Um, very, very closely based, as I indicated before, on the behaviourist psychology of B.F. Skinner, which is all about, you know, kind of powerful off dog kind of thing. Mm. You have the, the stimulus and then you give the response and you're given reinforcement, which is either reward or punishment. Um, so in the case of Pavlov's dogs, they learned to associate the sound of the bell with somebody bringing food. And so eventually, even if somebody didn't bring food, they would just hear the bell and they would still think they were going to be fed. Yeah, that's a kind of um, situation in which the behaviourist psychology is very accurate. But doesn't capture the complexity of how humans think and learn. Okay, so there was this on the one hand, the theory of learning, on the other hand, the 
theory of language, which is very much based on Chomsky, very formalistic about the formal properties of language, not language in use, in communication, but language in abstract, in isolation. So as a reaction against this, people started to think about how you can introduce communicative competence. There was a lot of influence from people like Dal Himes, um, anthropologists and sociologists who were looking at social situations about the context of culture and how that influences language and use. And then eventually in terms of the methodologists, um, Dave Wilkins, and also Dave Willis, so I mentioned earlier, Jane Willis' husband, um, long before the year of time space learning, he was also quite involved in the early days of the communicative approach. So it was an approach to learning that was based in the context of culture, a kind of approach to linguistics that was starting to emerge then, primarily through the work of Michael Halliday and systemic functional linguistics, very much based upon context of use and the broader context of culture. So people became much more aware of language as a means of communication rather than just an abstract formal system. Uh, building on that, while I wait for the next question, um, we see the effectiveness, we see the result, because now people actually do learn to communicate, people do use the language. Okay. As I said before, it used to be, in a lot of contexts, like in Greece, for example, people would learn the rules, they would learn about the language, rather than learning to use. They would have what you might call declarative knowledge about the language, rather than procedural knowledge of language use. And so the communicative approach has repositioned that so that language isn't an academic discipline in the way that maybe studying a dead language like Latin or ancient Greek is, but it's actually a means of communication. Next question. I have one more. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we have to exploit you. I, I, I wanted to ask, based on what you just said about the, with the importance of communicative approach, how much a teacher is, how much free a teacher is uh, if we think that he or she is working towards a specific goal, which is a proficiency or the Cambridge examinations in general. I mean, do these Cambridge examinations reflect the, the, all this theory of learning? Not entirely, and they do have a very strong effects on how we teach. It's an effect which is sometimes called the washback effect, or other people call it the backwash effect. For some reason, this time calling it washback. Anyway, um, the effect that the exam has on the way we teach, because exams are important to us, it's important for our teacher, for the students pass the exams, for the students often it's their prime motivation in learning a language, we need to succeed in the exam. If the exams are well designed, then they will also enable us to teach in ways which are consistent with what we want to be doing. And I think as the years go by, Cambridge exams are generally revised about every eight years. They do keep up, they do make changes in line with emerging knowledge and the theory of language learning methodology. So I'd say, on the whole, those exams tend to be quite good. Now, I have no affiliation with Cambridge, we happen to be hosted but here we today are here, in so these August premises. We have closed the doors, I suppose. <laughs> but, <after> the, um, <laughs> The exams that I am involved with <laughs> is the Greek state exams. And I think they're brilliant. What, which ones? The Greek state exams. Oh, okay, I, I work a little bit, I train examiners for the Karatikopis, to be a and math, yes. And I think they're very, very good exams. They're relatively recent. The first exam started in 2003, so they've got a very new kind of um, conceptualization of language, language testing. And they do a lot of very interesting things, they do them very well. Do you, do you get the part here with this? So no, because we don't have a C2 exam. In terms of the academic point though, the, the fact of the matter is by learning the language, you're not qualified as a teacher. 
you might think, well, I know the language, so I can teach it. It's not true. I think, well, by the same logic, if you have graduated from the Nipia from Yale, you should then be qualified to be in Yale or Yes, it's, it's ridiculous. It doesn't work like that. You've learned the language, but you know nothing about teaching methods, and you know nothing under the surface. I think, I mean, even to be a driving instructor, which is a very practical and not at all academic kind of uh, an occupation, you need to know a lot more than just simply being able to drive. Okay, so for somebody who wants to be a serious teacher, you need to have a knowledge of what's effective. And the other aspect of that also is that as the years go by, we are actually acquiring a lot of knowledge, <coughs> particularly in psycholinguistics or on a more sort of physical underlying level to that neurolinguistic, and we're learning a lot about how the brain works. We've got all kinds of technologies being invented all the time that are opening up a lot of knowledge about how the brain works, how the mind works, how learning occurs, how language is processed. And of course we should be taking this knowledge in order to use it in our teaching. So we need to know more about the cognitive skills of people and how these theories are implemented in various disciplines actually, not, not just learning. Uh, so a teacher should be aware of all these theories in order to know which parts are affected and how these things can be combined in order to help your student acquire better in a more naturalistic way. And if you don't know the basic functions of the brain or of how information is stored, or if you are completely unaware of all the cognitive skills of people, how can you teach effectively, even if you are, if you consider yourself to be number one communicator or number one teacher, if you lack all this scientific background, you can't actually really help your students. This is, this is debatable, this is how can you... Maybe you can help the students, but it's also self-rewarding. Um, Think that because if, if you know all these things, you, if the, the whole of the class is enriched, and this, I, and you, I include myself as a teacher in this enrichment process, because the more you learn, the more things that you that you always do. If you find out the theory behind that, behind that, or the research that has been done, and, and maybe even the contradictions and, and the, the, the debates on things, it, it becomes more enriching for you as a teacher. Yes. And challenging. Challenging, yeah. Yes. And then you become reflective and you know that there is a huge debate there. Or a certain, for example, teaching grammar, as we said before, we know that there are huge debates there, theoretically speaking. But then when you go and teach this particular form, you, you can think at the same time that Oh well, this time it worked for me, so I'm on this side of the debate. And the next time it might not work. And this kind of reflective uh, activity that goes on through your teaching is very enriching, I think. Mm -hmm. yep. So it gives you tools to develop, and it means that you become a professional. Um, but yes, I think reflection also linked to the observation as well, those two things. It's something that anyone can do. You don't need to study in order to do that. But anyone can reflect on their lessons, keep a journal, just think about what went well in a lesson, why you think it went well or what went less well, mm -hmm. how it could be improved, make some notes and maybe keep those for a period of time so you can see how things develop. And then if you're able to, depending on the context of where you teach, observation particularly the kind of cooperative development um, which I mentioned where you can have two people, two colleagues, two friends exchanging observations. So it's not a hierarchical thing, you're not being judged, you're not being evaluated, but you're simply offering observation. Peter, in the context of private lessons, can this observation or peer observation be assisted with equipment like this so that I'm doing a private lesson and I'm recording my lesson so that I can then see what is going on. Absolutely. Yeah, or maybe share it with another colleague and discuss it. Yep, I think if you share it, you're likely to get more input, more perspectives. But certainly recording your lessons, ideally on video, 
or even on audio. It's a very, very good way. Because when you're busy with all the stuff that's going on in the lesson, you can't really step outside it and reflect and really understand the processes of what's going on. Um, if you have a recording, and this is something we do in the third year of the BA program in the practical teaching, I record the lessons and then we review them with the students so they're able to see it and comment on it and reflect upon it and also I give my comments as we go along. So you've got a whole different perspective once you step outside and see yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, we've had several contributions, comments, questions from the front end here. <laughs> um, do we have any questions or comments from over this side? Yes, I'm sure. Well, 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 there is a question. Yep. <laughs> um, uh, a lot of what you said went into grammar. And my question is more than black. And um, how can I relate, how can I connect this in grammar uh, with uh, this interaction uh, um, process? I mean, uh, can I ask students to? Yes. Yes. So you, you design tasks where the grammar you want to focus on will naturally emerge. So if we say, okay, I want you to talk about yourself, it could be using a lot of present simple. We're talking about your interests, your hobbies, your routines. This is another very cultural British thing, is that we're not hobbies, we don't have hobbies. Yeah, so the question is not coming everywhere. You have a silent class. Yeah. And how many people do you know who collects stamps? <laughs> <laughs> You've got to live in a very cold of flies. <laughs> um, so I'll take back the bit about hobbies. But yes, yeah, talking about your regular activities. Or could you rephrase the question, talking about your achievements, things you have done. You're going to be using present perfect. Okay. Um, or your ambitions, you're going to be using maybe future simple, maybe present continuous and going to future. So you design the task according to the grammar that you want to focus on. Okay, now if you were to go in the sort of task-based learning style of doing things, you wouldn't even have a predetermined grammar focus. You just set up the task and practice whatever language happens to come up. But I would suggest though, let's say, going back to the example of present perfect that I mentioned before, um, you start a lesson with pictures of various landmarks and ask people, have you ever visited Paris? Have you ever seen the Eiffel Tower? Maybe give a few questions, give them a model and then get people interacting together, discussing in pairs and groups where they've been, what they've done. Okay. Or another activity which works well is having a questionnaire where people have to firstly form questions. It's kind of like a substitution drill in a way. Um, forming questions using the present purpose. You've got to ask a question, have you ever? And then using whatever promise you're given, again it could be have you ever visited Paris? Have you ever flown an aeroplane? So you're giving them a communicative task to interact with each other, which incidentally uses the target grammar. And then, okay, you're presupposing that they're going to know the grammar to a certain extent. Okay, we need also to realize that knowing something is not black and white, it's not yes I do or no I don't, it's a gradual process. Um, you can provide error correction, of course, if people say things like, I have never flew an aeroplane. Then you pick up that error and you need to find ways to address that. Maybe just correcting it on the spot, maybe pointing out, maybe have a little chart with infinitive simple past, past participle. 
So in one way or another, a lot of the language input is in response to the learner's errors. Building up on Katarina's question, is there any, any reason why the, the different grammar sections have to be taught in the order that they are taught? I mean, why do I have to teach first the, the simple present and the, the simple past, the continuous in between, and then go to the present verb or whatever, and then go to the reported speech and then passive voice? Why can't I start with passive voice, for example? Very good question. Um, it just came up well, there, because of what you There asked. are two kinds of answers to that. The one that is maybe the, the less important one, the one I'll start with, is, is commercial pressure and is what people expect. So you look at a, a variety of different course books and different publishers, they all have the same stuff in the same order. Yes. Because it's yes. <laughs> now, moving away from that rather cynical response, which is actually the most um, comprehensive one, we do know from second language acquisition research that there are orders of acquisition. Mm -hmm. So certain things can't be acquired before certain other things. And it would be kind of backwards to try and teach passive voice before the active voice. It just wouldn't. On the other hand though, you look at, let's say, books for junior A, obviously the first thing you get is the imperative, stand up, sit down, mm -hmm. right, look. Which is natural, it's the shortest and simplest verb phrase. Um, and then you probably get present continuous. Okay. Um, now, I think my present continuous is well, first of all, the continuous aspect in general is very, 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 very much less used than the simple aspect. Yes. Particularly so why in my language. Yes. Right. <laughs> also, present continuous. I am standing here, I am talking, you are listening, you know that. I don't need to tell you that. I can think of no case, unless you're on the phone, where you actually tell people what you were doing at the time of speaking. Because you're speaking to them, they can see what you're doing. So all of this is totally pointless. Plus, because that is such a nonsensical kind of thing to express, the most common use of present continuous actually is to talk about future plans. So we say things like, we are having a party tomorrow night. That's where present continuous is made in years. So that particular bit of our course books is very odd. And then you get present simple coming next. Now the problem is, for great kids, nearly always in the junior A books, the example of present simple is I like. I like ice cream. Do you like ice cream? Which is fine because it's a state verb and you're not going to get confused with continuous aspects and stuff. But Greek kids can never get their heads around it because it's backwards for them. And if you know this, and if you're a Greek author, you're a Greek publisher, don't use like. Use a different verb. So there is a logic to the order that they presented it, but that logic is often flawed. But mainly, I suppose, the chief answer, apart from the rather cynical one, is that yes, there is a lot of knowledge from second language acquisition research about acquisition order. And some things that have always missed them. I remember when I first came to Athens, I was teaching here proficiency classes, 25 hours a week of proficiency. And not the same class, five different classes. Um, and I was struck being a very new, young, unqualified teacher with no real knowledge of teaching at all. I was struck by the way that people always leave off what's called the third person S. So instead of, she talks, she talk. And I was really struck by this because I had all these students, I had five different groups, there were maybe about 60 or 70 students all together, really high level, but however well they spoke, they, so many of them would always make this error. I couldn't imagine why, it seems so easy. And then of course we find out when we study <coughs> It's simply because it's redundant, it's not necessary. It's also a very unusual morphological change in English. And so people just ignore it, they don't notice it, they don't remember it. 